Today we are going to talk about the offense, talking about the floors, which we've seen over the last couple of years, could be pretty low, and the new ceiling for the Tigers offense in 2024, all today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Wednesday, January 10th, 2024. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning winning. Rather, $5 money line bet. That's $150. If your team wins, visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Welcome back. Hope everybody's having a fantastic week so far. Found these cool sunglasses. If you're watching on uh, on YouTube that I was wearing. Oh, they're sh- they have sharks on the side, which I noticed, which is why I put them on. But they're actually like Shark Week, like Discovery Channel Shark Week sunglasses. So... Pretty sick, not going to lie. Might do the whole show like this. Not really. Okay. Today we're going to talk about the offense. Let's talk about hitting some baseballs, uh, something that the Tigers have struggled with immensely, really, to be completely straight up about it over the last two seasons. Um, 2022 was horrific uh, for a lot of reasons, but uh, the biggest one was that this offense was absolutely dreadful. Um, The Detroit Tigers objectively, Okay, not even arguable in no way, shape, or form is it in is it even possible to disagree, which I as you all know, I don't say very often, but they objectively took a step forward offensively from 2022 to 2023. Okay. Now that wasn't hard. <laughs> Again, I, I cannot stress enough if you're a longtime listener to the show, first off, I appreciate you and your support greatly, but if you're a longtime listener and you remember listening back into the 2022 season, you will remember uh, how often we talked about how historically bad this offense was. This was not just, oh, they're one of the worst offenses in baseball or whatnot. That was 2023. 2022 was legitimately, and there's a lot of analytics that back this up, one of the worst offenses in the modern era of baseball. In the history of the sport. It was one of the worst offenses we have seen, no matter how old you are. So they weren't that in 2023. They objectively took a step forward. By the end of the year, we're going to use a lot of numbers in this episode. And uh, one of the numbers that I think is very easy to kind of get a decent gauge on how good a team's offense is, is WRC+. Weighted runs created plus. Um, weighted runs created has been a stat that a lot of people have really gotten a hold of and has gotten a lot more popular over the last three or four years. Um, and it, it, it takes weighted situations into account, uh, and how many runs you create based on those and obviously different values have different weights, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, that is all the plus at the end it just simply means it's on a scale where a hundred is league average. So, If you have a 100 WRC plus, you are exactly a league average hitter in the eyes of the statistic. Um, No team had a 100 WRC plus on the year. Obviously, plenty of players did. Um, The two that were in the middle were 15 and 16 or 14 and 15 in the rankings. Uh, The Red Sox had a 99 and the Mets had a 101. So just to give you an idea of what uh, kind of the league average offenses are, of baseball in 2023 looked like there were two teams that didn't make the postseason. And those were kind of, again, on one on one side, one on the other side of just around exactly being league average offenses. Teams averaged out. I guess, it, you know, if you just think that run scored is just simply the best way to do that, then that's fine as well. But in, in terms, in the, in the context of WRC+, those are the teams that were right in the middle. 
The Braves obviously led baseball pretty comfortably, too. It wasn't even particularly close. Uh, they were the only team in the league that had a WRC plus of above 120, and it was 125. The Rays were second at 118. So the the Braves had were a 25% better offense than a league average offense, again, in the eyes of this statistic specifically, and 7% better than the Rays, who were second. The Tigers were 27th in 2023. They had an 89 WRC plus in the year 2023. The only teams with a worse, a worth, a worse WRC plus were the Kansas City Royals, the Chicago White Sox, and the Colorado Rockies. Somewhat hilarious that in the bottom four offenses in baseball, three of those four are all in the same division. Uh, which is why some people have uh, a lot of optimism going into 2024. We've talked about the AL Central plenty on this show after uh, over the last couple of years. Now, 2022, the Tigers had an 80 WRC plus and were comfortably the worst in baseball. The Pirates had an 83, the A's had an 83, and those were 28 and 29. So the Tigers were comfortably the worst. And again, this is one statistic and it's not like gospel either. I'm not saying that this is the only stat that matters. There's plenty and we'll talk about plenty more. We have a whole discussion about slugging percentage that we're about to get to. There's there's a, a, a lot more numbers, but in the terms of just this, it's, it's nice and easy because it's on a weighted scale and it's on a, a scale of 100 where you can see what league average is. The Tigers were better than they were in 2022 but still were a bottom four, bottom five offense in the game of baseball. Now in the second half of 2023, they were had a 95 WRC plus. Still below league average, which I think is important to point out. 95 is not like some groundbreaking earth-shattering thing. That is 5% worse than league average <laughs> offensively as a team, right? But you had that hot streak in August where Torgelson and Carpenter were hitting home runs left and right. And then you had the last month-ish of Carpenter where he didn't hit a single homer. Uh, you had Torkelson who, who had a much better second half than he did first half, OPS in 800s. We'll talk about individuals here later on in the show as well. But that 95 in the second half was somewhere in between, there's a couple ties in there, somewhere in between 16th and 19th in the ranking. Again, some ties, uh, you know, if you want to go like eight decimals deep, I don't know where they would have ended up, but they were about 18th in WRC plus uh, in the second half of last season. And they won some games and they kept their head above water and they were a competitive ball club, at least more than we're used to. And, uh, and found themselves finishing the season just under 500. Also a testament to how slow of a starting team the Tigers have been consistently what feels like forever, but specifically over the last three years. They have been horrible in April, three years in a row, and has really, really hindered them from taking that big step forward, going over in two of those three years, prevented them from going over 500. Um, and now when you look at season stats like this, you know, where we talked about the pitching was really good in the second half, the hitting was better in the second half. Um, if, if they were able to, to do that over 162, you could have even seen the Tigers go over 500 last year. So my point being, I, I want to take the, the beginning of the show here to just lay the scene. We, we can't really talk about what is going to happen in 2024 before talking about the last two years and the improvement, however marginal it may or may not be, uh, that they have seen over the last couple of seasons. So we're heading into 2024. We're, we're on the uptick. The biggest question I have for you, and this is something that I'm going to ask a lot throughout this show, and I do want to hear everybody's answers, um, because I, I don't mean this with any, like trying to sway anybody one way or another or with any negative connotation. I'm genuinely asking, if you're expecting the Tigers, 27th in WRC Plus last year, to take a big step forward offensively, where are they getting that production from? right? We can't just go, oh, well, we've been improving. It'll just happen by itself. What players specifically are you hanging your hat on to guarantee that this is even going to be a league average offense, which is a substantial improvement? That would have to be 11% better than 2023. And if you recall, 
In 2022, they were in 80, and last year there was an, they were in 89. That's 9%. So you're talking about a, a – a, and there's some, you know, the, the stat changes slightly year to year, so you can't really go year by year. Again, not trying to say that any of this is gospel, just trying to get everything down to one number for people to comprehend as best as possible. Um, it would have to be a, a substantial step forward for this team to even be a 100 WRC plus team. I'm not saying it's impossible. We will continue this conversation. We'll talk about where I think that production could come from. I do think the ceiling for this team is around a middle of the pack offense. But they were in 89 last year and they're adding Mark Canna and probably Colt Keith. And that's kind of it. It's kind of the same roster from what you ended the season as besides that last year. So let's keep the ball rolling. We're going to keep going with this conversation. One of the biggest reasons I think they struggle uh, just with offense in general, we'll talk about. Uh, and then we'll talk about individuals, obviously, as well. Some team profile stuff, still plenty to discuss. We will get into all of that right after I tell you all about our friends over at FanDuel. The NFL season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel. I guess it has wrapped up. Uh, the regular season is over and you can go to America's number one sports book in FanDuel and get in on all the action for the postseason. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use. There's so many different ways to bet as well. Live same game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explore tab. You can make a parlay in Parlay Hub, which is the best way to find popular parlays that everybody's doing around the country, and so much more, just standard money line spreads, etc. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked On Tigers. Appreciate you all for tuning in, as always, making us your first listen every day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will be back on Friday, as always. Uh, Locked On has also launched the first ever 24-7 sports streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league as well. So go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever National Sports 24-7 streaming channel. Here we're talking about the Detroit Tigers offense. And uh, I kind of set the scene talking about the last couple of years, the improvements that's needed. Uh, one of the biggest reasons why I think this team is finds itself in the bottom of the barrel in offense every year is team slugging percentage. This team, uh, you know, a couple of years ago didn't draw any walks. They took a step forward in the right direction last year with that. Certainly Harris has been a big part of that as well, really wants people that do draw walks. They're still not like in the upper echelon, the upper half even of baseball in that category, but it's something that there's been a, I know, <laughs> there's one thing about Scott Harris, whether you like him or dislike him, it's that he's going to try to find dudes that draw walks. I know that that's being addressed on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the biggest things that concerns me is slugging. This team in 2023 had a 382 slugging percentage as a team. That is 28th in baseball. Again, something that got better in the second half of the year. They found themselves closer to middle of the pack, but even in post All-Star break, they were a 397. They were still sub 400 slugging percentage. The Rockies had a 405 slugging percentage last year and were 20th in baseball. 20th and they were four, they were the the worst team that was over 400. The uh the Kansas City Royals had a 398 and they were 21st. Okay? So that 397 in the second half did you improve? Yes. Was it good? No. Right? Like it, it's just it's so easy to see improvement and be like, "Okay, well, like this is, you know, this is really exciting and it is really exciting. I'm not trying to take away from the second half of last year, which, which again, objectively was good signs. Um, but there's a difference between being good and just improving from being awful. And I think that that's very, very important to highlight. Um, I, I also, again, want to reiterate, this is, this is best and worst case scenarios. So when we get closer to the season, I'll go much more in depth and we can have a, a big conversation about my like 
specific expectations for individual players, the offense as a whole, et cetera. Right now, we're talking about best case scenario, worst case scenario. What's the window that this offense is going to work with? The, the the bottom of that window, right, is not good. And, and and it's not that that's not me being pessimistic. That's just the last two years. <laughs> that that's objective. That that's very hard to argue against. I feel like, right? I mean, you're you're talking. You're talking about a team that that has struggled immensely at the plate the last couple of years. So um, the ceiling is where it gets really exciting and the optimist in me gets to come out of. It's kind of been doom and gloom so far. Buckle up. We're, we're hopefully, we'll, we'll see where it takes me. We'll get uh, a little more optimistic here. I, I do think that there are players that are primed to take big steps, right? We talk about Kerry Carpenter uh, and how he didn't have a home run the last six weeks of the season. Hopefully that is something that is nipped in the butt. Adjustments are made and he can improve. He led the team in WRC plus last year with 121, right? He was a phenomenal hitter, had a really solid slugging percentage, even with the lack of power the last six weeks of the season. Uh, he, he was the man. And so he's going to be a fixture in this lineup and is somebody that I think we're all really excited for to take another step forward. Spencer Torkelson, probably the biggest one, right? Uh, even with the 30 home runs, and uh, and the hot second half still had an OPS at the end of the year in the 700s. I've been saying this all off season. If you're an everyday or this isn't a new a new take from me, I really really want Spencer Torkelson's OPS next year to start with the number eight. I think that would be a, a huge step in the right direction. I think that that would be great for his confidence. That would also mean that he probably is getting better in batting average which I know that there's always a big debate about how much batting average matters and et cetera, et cetera. Um, he's walking at a decent clip, almost 10% of the time. Uh, he's not striking out a boatload. We saw that he has 30 plus home run power. His OBP was like 80 points better than his average, but his average was 233. So the OBP, although the, he has a high walk rate, is still, it's like 313, which is far from awful. But I think you're planning on that being a lot higher down the road and if you want him to be a fixture in the middle of your lineup. If he can even get to being around a 250 hitter and walk 10% of the time, we're with the power that we've already seen in year one that hopefully will only even improve, we're talking about, that, about a guy that could be a legitimate middle of the lineup bat for this baseball team. We've talked about the adjustments he made a lot last year, et cetera. Riley Green, second best WRC plus on the team last year, 119, but played in less than 100 games. I don't think anyone's really afraid of Riley Green not being that caliber of hitter long-term. I think the biggest concern is just his health. So that's another one. Obviously, it's if he stays healthy and he's putting up that production in May last year, he had a, an OPS over 1,000 in the month of May uh, before his injury in early June. Like this is uh, this is a guy who I mean uh, he was my favorite prospect in the Tiger system. I, I think that he's the future of the franchise. I uh, I think the world of Riley Green. Uh, Got to keep him on the field though to be able to reap those benefits. Obviously, so those three are really easy to point to and be like this could be some big steps forward again. Even though they had a pretty solid year last year, but three guys improving is not going to take this team from a bottom tier, bottom five offense in baseball to even a middle of the pack lineup. You're going to have to improve top to bottom. And that is where, again, I ask the question, where are you getting the legitimate improvements from with this team from last year to this year? You bring in Mark Canna. Okay, if he's even a league average hitter around you know 97 to 102 WRC plus, let's say he gets you a two war season et cetera, et cetera, right? An OPS in the in the seven mid high 700s, 750 to 770. He walks a lot. Great. If you have that going for you, that that's an addition, right? That that's a that's a clear addition. Last season, you had Carpenter, Green, Torkelson, and Andy Abanez. Those were the only guys that had a WRC plus over 100 that were considered above league average hitters according to this metric, right? Andy Abanez, I don't think we should be relying on to have a WRC plus over 100 uh, this upcoming season. I would be shocked if he replicated that over 115 games again. If he does, more power to him. Um, I'm glad he's around. It was a great pickup. All that, but uh, I, I don't think we can, like, with ink, pen in above league average hitter Andy Abanez 2024. I think that that would be uh, a little, I don't know, forward. 
uh, will say. Next up, Matt Veerling, 99 WRC+. plus. How much better is Matt Veerling? Uh, I think that there's some mechanics that really bother me with Veerling and I think is a, a big reason. We've talked about it a lot on this show. I'm sure we'll talk about it again in 2024. Um, I And it really is, I think, the biggest reason as to why he's not able to get over that hump and, and utilize all of his tools to the best uh, or t- – he is doing it to the best of his ability. I'm not saying he's not trying, but um, I, I think that there's some stuff mechanically that if was ironed out, he could take a big step forward. I have no clue if that's going to happen though. Uh, Jake Rogers, we know what Jake Rogers is, right? 97 WRC plus, 221 average, but with uh, you know some power, decent walk numbers, very very high strikeout numbers, comfortably the highest on the team, um, but is a 20 plus home run power threat. And you got him for your defense. You, you, we're not going to expect Jake Rogers to take some big step forward offensively and be some like 250 average, 500 slug, you know, eight 850 OPS type of guy. This is probably what Jake Rogers is. Akil Badu doesn't even really have a spot on this lineup right now. We'll see what happens with him. Uh, Zach McKinstry, outside of May, was well below league average. Uh, he ended the season with an 81 WRC plus, and he like was second in all of baseball and walks in May. And had like an almost an a thousand OPS. So like you take away that month, you're talking about a guy who really is like we're talking 25, 30 percent worse than league average. Uh, Tyler Nevin, uh, obviously not going to be like a, a big offensive threat at the major league level. Um, Nick Maton had a boatload of struggles last year. Javi Baez, can he rebound a little bit? I mean, sure, uh, but I'm not holding my breath on that necessarily. Carson Kelly walked a decent amount, but hit 173. Um, Ryan Kreidler, uh, hopefully he can get a legitimate look in spring. I'm excited about Kreidler. Not sure I'm going to be, you know, penciling him in for more than, a like 90, 92 WRC plus at best. And that's kind of it. The only other person that I didn't mention there was Parker Meadows, Parker Meadows. And then obviously we'll, again, we'll get to Colt Keith in a second. Parker Meadows walked almost 12% of the time. Love it. Uh, 232 average, 368 slug. He had a 94 WRC plus. I do expect Parker Meadows to take a step forward. Um, he is one that I, I think his decision making. I retweeted something, reposted whatever it's called now. Something uh, last week about that. Uh, his decision making was really, really solid. There's a lot of analytics to say that he was like swinging at the right pitches. He walked a boatload. He cut the strikeouts down as the season went along. In the minor leagues, he had proved that he has like 20 home run power as well. Uh, I am so unbelievably excited about Parker Meadows' season, um, but I I don't know if I see him as significantly more than a better than league average hitter. So that's my biggest question. It's like, okay, we want to take this big step forward. We want to we want to be close to a league average offense, right? We we want to get more into that conversation. Outside of those, you know, the the Carpenter, Green, Torkelson, who are going to be the players that take those big steps forward? How much are we going to rely on Colt Keith to be even a league average hitter as a true rookie? All questions that I have. And the reason why we do ceilings and floors is because the truth is often in the middle. And I'm sure that we will have a couple of those names I mentioned take steps forward. And B guys, and then a couple more that don't take steps forward and maybe even take steps back. That's just the name of the game. That is the game of baseball. For the teams that had a sub-100 WRC+, plus, you're talking about Boston, Cincinnati, Arizona, the Yankees, the Marlins, the Giants, the Guardians, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get into like, you know, the A's, the Royals, et cetera. So... If you can just have a league average offense, we've talked about the pitching, right? Talked about the pitching already. I think there's some optimism that this could be a borderline top 10 rotation at best, but even a league average, a little bit better than league average rotation. You're pumped about Scooble. You're knocking on the door of that 12, 11, 10 ranking in rotation. We talked about the bullpen earlier this week, right? Worst case scenario, uh, you kind of believe in your coaching staff. I think you can be, uh, you know, at worst a 20th bullpen, if not, you know, higher than league average pen. There's some faith in the in in the pitching at this point. There's some there's some legitimate faith 
that this team has the ability to get solid production from pitching. The big question and what will almost, not entirely, but almost single-handedly determine how effective and how legitimate this Tigers team is going to be in 2024 and how serious they're going to be about competing for the AL Central and about even going over 500 for the first time in whatever, eight years, is almost exclusively going to come down to is the offense going to take a step forward big enough to allow that to happen? And the reason why is because of all the variants. This could be one of the worst offenses in baseball for the third year in a row. Or the second half wasn't a mirage. And they are maybe closer to 95 over a full season. And they're going to get some improvement from guys. And Torgelson can do what he did in the second half all year. And Carpenter at his best, can prolong, stretch that out over a whole year. And Parker Meadows is now well acclimated and can be really effective. And Colt Keith can be a legitimate, you know, AL Rookie of the Year type of candidate. And, and, and. This is why we start off these conversations with talking about best and worst case scenario and kind of iron our sights in to what the realistic expectations of the team are. Because there's a whole lot of outcomes for this offense, man. I we I could talk about that. I need to get to an ad break. I'm already way behind. I could talk about this for like two hours, legitimately. If we wanted to go like one by one, and we'll we will do that just over the course of a couple of weeks. Once pitchers and catchers report, we'll talk about individual players a lot more and what their expectations are for the year um, uh, in, in February and March. But this really is uh, an offense that that I think could be a league average, even slightly better than league average offense. But it also could stay at the bottom, and that wouldn't really shock me either. 89 WRC plus, you're adding starting-wise, Mark Canna and and Colt Keith. And that's not with negative connotation. There's just a lot of variance. That's just the point I'm trying to prove. Not trying to sway you one way or another, say that the worst case is going to happen or that the best case is going to happen. Because I don't think really that that's... <laughs> usually it's somewhere in the middle. But there is a uh, a legitimate amount of questions yet to be answered. And it's January at the end of the day. So we'll see. All right. I really need to get to an ad break. I am so far behind on that. We'll come back, talk a little bit more about the offense. I want to do some, some metric stuff. Uh, in terms of the profile of hitters that the Tigers have, and then we'll send you on with your Wednesday. All right, we will do that right after I tell you all about our friends over at Jace Medical. I know we come to sports to escape from uh, the everyday, kind of the the busyness of day-to-day life, uh, but you also want to be prepared for real life. And thankfully, we will be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics that treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinuses, skin infections, amongst others. This stuff could truly happen to any of us. So be prepared. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board certified physician and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. So go to jacemedical.com and use promo code locked on, all one word, to get $20 off of your order. That's jacemedical.com, promo code locked on for $20 off of your order. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Third and final segment, Locked On Tigers. This is going to be a relatively quick third and final segment, considering I'm getting back from break when the show is supposed to be wrapping up. Uh, but we really got on a tangent there of uh, talking about the uh, the Tigers' offense, obviously. So I, I I hope I've painted a decent picture of kind of where my head is at. I just I really think there's a lot of possibilities um, of how this offense could uh, produce. I, I think that it's really spread across the board. And, and like I said, as we get closer to spring training, we'll kind of narrow more and more in uh, about what's kind of the is in the middle there, who we do expect to maybe take those big steps forward, who we do expect to take those big steps back, because I already have some opinions on 
uh, some of those players. But again, we'll get to those when we uh, when when we're closer to pitchers and catchers and, and spring training and whatnot. Um, the the only other thing I really want to do is just talk about the team's makeup last year, as far as some some underlying analytics go. Uh, this team did improve greatly in hard hit rate. Uh, which is something that we talked about through the year periodically. Um, th this team was was hitting the ball decent. And they weren't like, you know, top eight or, or, you know, five in baseball or anything by the end of the year, but they were in the top half uh, of the league in hard hit rate. And uh, I, I think, but they weren't grounding out a boatload either, but they also weren't hitting line drives, which is like kind of the goal. You want to barrel up the baseball. The thing that they did was they hit the ball hard and they hit fly balls. Uh, they were in the the upper echelon in baseball in both of those categories. And that's just something that I think is, um, A, one of the reasons why they brought the walls in slightly. Uh, but B, for a team that is so low in the ranks in slugging percentage, is something that especially in the second half of last year when you saw an uptick in slug and you saw more home runs uh, after a year and a half of seeing essentially zero – I, I do view that as a good sign. Uh, when you look at some of the other teams in the league that led in fly ball rate, uh, the Dodgers led baseball pretty comfortably, almost by two whole percent. Uh, then you have the Rangers at two. You have the Mariners at four, the Twins at five, the Astros at six, and the Tigers at eight in fly ball rate. Uh, the teams that are sprinkled in there that I skipped because they don't fit my narrative – uh, but to, to, to be fair to everybody, the Angels were third and the Yankees were seventh, both ahead of the Tigers um, and the Braves, who are an absolute juggernaut hitting home runs left and right, were 10th. Now, the thing that proves the point with the Braves is then if you switch from fly ball rate to just barrel rate, right? Barrels in, in uh, on Baseball Savant are specifically... Balls that are within a certain range of launch angle, is it 20 to 25 degrees, and then 95 or more uh, miles an hour of exit velocity. The Braves had almost a 12% barrel rate as a team, which is preposterous. That is ignorant. Like that, that is absolutely absurd. Um, and the twins were in second with 10.3. Obviously the twins held on to the AL central in the second half of the year. Uh, the Mariners third Dodgers, fifth Rangers, sixth, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, um, that's something that I want to see the tigers improve on is barrel rate because they hit a lot of fly balls, but they were in the bottom 15 in baseball, the bottom half of the league in barrel rate. It's a big difference between just hitting a fly ball and barreling up a baseball. And I think that that is a huge thing that as a team, if we can just make a small enough adjustment to go from, okay, this is a, a lazy fly ball, we're hitting a lot of balls in the air, to actually barreling these things up, you could see that big spike in production. Okay, um, Walk rate, obviously something that's going to be talked about a lot. Another thing that I want to uh, just point out here really quickly, I, and then I'll, I promise I'll let you go on with your Wednesday is uh, is whiff rate. They were around middle of the pack, almost exactly. Uh, I think they were 14th in whiff rate. Uh, I'll take that given where the team has been at. Um, but something that I found interesting was that the Tigers were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eighth in just zone percentage. So that is just straight up pitches thrown in the strike zone to the Tigers offense. The eighth highest rate in baseball. Uh, the, so they, they got, sh they had the eighth most, Balls in the zone thrown to them. Hopefully I articulated that well. Um, and then when you look at zone swing percentage, they're still around top 10, just outside of the top 10 there. Good. Zone contact percentage, you're sliding down even further. You're getting closer to that 15 range, you know, almost. You're like barely in the top half of baseball. So for a team that saw the eighth most balls in the strike zone period throughout the year. I would like to see the zone swing percentage and zone contact percentage. While they weren't bad, they were very far from bad, be a little closer in ranking to that straight up zone percentage because both of those were, were pretty comfortably lower. Okay. Just in terms of ranking, obviously. So just something that I, uh, I wanted to point out here. We already talked about whiff rate. Um, Ground ball rate, they've been they they improved a lot on. Uh, they're they're not uh, very 
hefty ground ball team. That's kind of like there are teams that are really good that hit a ton of ground balls like the Rays. And there's also teams that are really good that don't hit any ground balls like the like the Dodgers. Um, so that's kind of a, not an exact correlation. But uh, for a team that is is pulling the ball more, starting to pull the ball more than they used to and hitting the ball in the air more, um, I uh, we just need to see that barrel rate go up to match the high fly ball rate we have if that's going to be the identity of the team. And then obviously all of this comes back to the true identity, which is draw more walks. Um, that is something that has very clearly been pounded in everybody's head in this organization for the last, ever since Scott Harris took over for the last two years. And uh, hopefully we'll continue to do so because I like the identity. I'm a big component of that. I, I was, if you're a longtime listener, I've been asking for that since well before Harris was uh, on the radar for this team. And so I uh, I think that, that taking more steps forward, because they were pretty like not awesome when compared to the rest of baseball in terms of just like walks drawn, but it was a significant step forward from where they have been. So uh, just continue to take strides in that strides in that department as well. Okay, cool. Thanks for making Lockdown Tigers your first listen every single day, free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune every day. We will be back on Wednesday. Um, I think that's it. Rest in peace, Kurt Dozier. Fantastic uh, photographer for the free for many, many years. A big loss to this community. Big loss to the media circuit uh, and just this city in general. All right. Just want to say that before I wrapped up. Peace and love. Going to therapy's dope. I will catch you all on Friday, baby. Go Tigers.